Robert I, popularly known as Robert the Bruce, was King of Scots from 1306 until his death in 1329. Robert was one of the most famous warriors of his generation, and eventually led Scotland during the first of the wars of Scottish independence against England. He fought successfully during his reign to regain Scotland's place as an independent nation and is today remembered in Scotland as a national hero. Descended from the Anglo-Norman and Gaelic nobilities, his paternal fourth great-grandfather was David I. Robert's grandfather, Robert de Bruce, 5th Lord of Annandale, was one of the claimants to the Scottish throne during the Great Cause. As Earl of Carrick, Robert the Bruce supported his family's claim to the throne and took part in William Wallace's revolt against Edward I of England. In 1298, Bruce became a guardian of Scotland alongside his great rival for the Scottish throne, John Cummin, and William Lamberton, Bishop of St. Andrews. Bruce resigned as guardian in 1300 due in part to his quarrels with Cummin but chiefly because the restoration of King John seemed imminent. In 1302, he submitted to Edward I and returned to the king's peace. When his father died in 1304, Bruce inherited his family's claim to the throne. In February 1306, following an argument during a meeting at Greyfriars Monastery, Dumfries, Bruce killed Cuman. He was excommunicated by the Pope but absolved by Robert Wishart, Bishop of Glasgow. Bruce moved quickly to seize the throne and was crowned King of Scots on 25 March 1306 at Scone. Edward I's forces defeated Robert in battle, and Bruce was forced to flee into hiding in the Hebrides in Ireland before returning in 1307 to defeat an English army at Loudon Hill and wage a highly successful guerrilla war against the English. Bruce defeated the commons and his other Scots enemies, destroying their strongholds and devastating their lands from Buchan to Galloway. In 1309, he held his first parliament at St Andrews, and a series of military victories between 1310 and 1314 won him control of much of Scotland. At the Battle of Bannockburn in June 1314, Bruce defeated a much larger English army under Edward II, confirming the re-establishment of an independent Scottish monarchy. The battle marked a significant turning point, and, freed from English threats, Scotland's armies could now invade northern England. Bruce launched devastating raids into Lancashire and Yorkshire. He also decided to expand his war against the English and create a second front by sending an army under his younger brother, Edward, to invade Ireland, appealing to the native Irish to rise against Edward II's rule. Despite Bannockburn and the capture of the final English stronghold at Berwick in 1318, Edward II refused to give up his claim to the overlordship of Scotland. In 1320, the Scottish magnates and nobles submitted the Declaration of Arbroath to Pope John XXII, declaring Bruce as their rightful monarch and asserting Scotland's status as an independent kingdom. In 1324, the Pope recognised Bruce as king of an independent Scotland, and in 1326, the Franco-Scottish alliance was renewed in the Treaty of Corbeil. In 1327, the English deposed Edward II in favour of his son, Edward III, and peace was temporarily concluded between Scotland and England with the Treaty of Edinburgh-Northampton, by which Edward III renounced all claims to sovereignty over Scotland. Robert the Bruce died on 7 June 1329. His body is buried in Dunfermline Abbey, while his heart was interred in Melrose Abbey. Bruce's lieutenant and friend Sir James Douglas agreed to take the late king's embalmed heart on crusade to the Lord's sepulchre in the Holy Land, but he reached only as far as Moorish Granada. Douglas was killed in battle during the siege of Teba while fulfilling his promise. His body and the casket containing the embalmed heart were found upon the field. They were both conveyed back to Scotland by Sir William Keith of Galston. Background and Early Life Robert de Bruce, 1st Lord of Annandale, the first of the Bruce, or de Bruce, 
line arrived in Scotland with David I in 1124 and was given the lands of Annandale in Dumfries and Galloway. Robert was the first son of Robert de Bruce, 6th Lord of Annandale, and Marjorie, Countess of Carrick, and claimed the Scottish throne as a fourth great-grandson of David I. His mother was by all accounts a formidable woman who, legend would have it, kept Robert Bruce's father captive until he agreed to marry her. From his mother, he inherited the earldom of Carrick, and through his father, a royal lineage that would give him a claim to the Scottish throne. The Bruces also held substantial estates in Geary, Essex, Middlesex, and County Durham. Although Robert the Bruce's date of birth is known, his place of birth is less certain. Although it is most likely to have been Turnberry Castle in Esher, the head of his mother's earldom, very little is known of his youth. He was probably brought up in a mixture of the Anglo-Norman culture of Northern England and Southeastern Scotland, and the Gaelic culture of Southwest Scotland and most of Scotland north of the River Forth. Annandale was thoroughly feudalised in the form of Northern Middle English that would later develop into the Scots language was spoken throughout the region. Carrick was historically an integral part of Galloway, and though the Earls of Carrick had achieved some feudalisation, the Society of Carrick at the end of the 13th century remained emphatically Celtic and Gaelic-speaking. Robert the Bruce would most probably have become trilingual at an early age. He would have spoken both the Anglo-Norman language of his Scots-Norman peers and his father's family, and the Gaelic language of his Carrick birthplace and his mother's family. He would also have spoken the early Scots language. The family would have moved between the castles of their lordships, Lochmaben Castle, the main castle of the lordship of Annandale, and Turnberry and Loch Doon Castle, the castles of the earldom of Carrick. Robert had nine siblings, and he and his brother Edward may have been fostered according to Gaelic tradition spending a substantial part of their youth at the courts of other noblemen. As heir, Robert would have been schooled by tutors in all the requirements of courtly etiquette, and he would have waited as a page at his father's and grandfather's tables. This grandfather, known to contemporaries as Robert the Noble, and to history as Bruce the Competitor, seems to have been an immense influence on the future king. Robert's first appearance in history is on a witness list of a charter issued by Alexander Og MacDonald, Lord of Isla. Robert Bruce, the king-to-be, was 16 years of age when Margaret, maid of Norway, died in 1290. It is also around this time that Robert would have been knighted, and he began to appear on the political stage in the Bruce dynastic interest. Robert's mother died early in 1292. In November of the same year Edward I of England, on behalf of the Guardians of Scotland and following their great cause, awarded the vacant crown of Scotland to his grandfather's first cousin once removed, John Balliol. Almost immediately, his grandfather, Robert de Bruce, 5th Lord of Annandale, resigned his lordship of Annandale and his claim to the throne to Robert's father. Days later that son, Robert de Bruce, 6th Lord of Annandale, resigned the earldom of Carrick he had held in right of his late wife to their son, Robert, the future king. Even after John's accession, Edward still continued to assert his authority over Scotland and relations between the two kings soon began to deteriorate. The Bruces sided with King Edward against King John and his common allies. Robert the Bruce and his father both considered John a usurper, against the objections of the Scots. Edward I agreed to hear appeals on cases ruled on by the court of the guardians that had governed Scotland during the interregnum. A further provocation came in a case brought by Macduff, son of Malcolm, Earl of Fife, in which Edward demanded that John appear in person before the English Parliament to answer the charges. This the Scottish king did, but the final straw was Edward's demand that the Scottish magnates provide military service in England's war against France. This was unacceptable, the Scots instead formed an alliance with France. The common dominated council acting in the name of King John summoned the Scottish host to meet at Cadenley on the 11th of March. 
The Bruces and the Earls of Angus and March refused, and the Bruce family withdrew temporarily from Scotland, while the Commons seized their estates in Annandale and Carrick, granting them to John Cummin, Earl of Buchan. Edward I thereupon provided a safe refuge for the Bruces, having appointed the Lord of Annandale to the command of Carlisle Castle in October 1295. At some point in early 1296, Robert married his first wife, Isabella of Mar, the daughter of Domnall I, Earl of Mar and his wife Helen. Beginning of the Wars of Independence Almost the first blow in the war between Scotland and England was a direct attack on the Bruces. On 26 March 1296, Easter Monday, seven Scottish earls made a surprise attack on the walled city of Carlisle, which was not so much an attack against England as the common Earl of Buchan and the faction attacking their Bruce enemies. Both his father and grandfather were at one time governors of the castle, and following the loss of Annandale to Cummin in 1295, it was their principal residence. Robert Bruce would have gained first-hand knowledge of the city's defences. The next time Carlisle was besieged, in 1315, Robert the Bruce would be leading the attack. Edward I responded to King John's alliance with France and the attack on Carlisle by invading Scotland at the end of March 1296 and taking the town of Berwick in a particularly bloody attack upon the flimsy palisades. At the Battle of Dunbar, Scottish resistance was effectively crushed. Edward deposed King John, placed him in the Tower of London, and installed Englishmen to govern the country. The campaign had been very successful, but the English triumph would only be temporary. Although the Bruces were by now back in possession of Annandale and Carrick, in August 1296 Robert Bruce, Lord of Annandale, and his son, Robert Bruce, Earl of Carrick and future king, were among the more than 1,500 Scots at Berwick who swore an oath of fealty to King Edward I of England. When the Scottish revolt against Edward I broke out in July 1297, James Stuart, 5th High Steward of Scotland, led into rebellion a group of disaffected Scots, including Robert Wishart, Bishop of Glasgow, Macduff, the son of the Earl of Fife, and the young Robert Bruce. The future king was now 22, and in joining the rebels he seems to have been acting independently of his father who took no part in the rebellion and appears to have abandoned Annandale once more for the safety of Carlisle. It appears that Robert Bruce had fallen under the influence of his grandfather's friends, Wishart and Stuart, who had inspired him to resistance. With the outbreak of the revolt, Robert left Carlisle and made his way to Annandale, where he called together the knights of his ancestral lands and, according to the English chronicler Walter of Gisborough, addressed them thus, No man holds his own flesh and blood in hatred and I am no exception. I must join my own people and the nation in which I was born. I ask that you please come with me and you will be my counsellors and close comrades. Urgent letters were sent ordering Bruce to support Edward's commander, John de Wiren, 6th Earl of Surrey, in the summer of 1297, but instead of complying, Bruce continued to support the revolt against Edward I. That Bruce was in the forefront of fermenting rebellion is shown in a letter written to Edward by Hugh Cressingham on 23 July 1292, which reports the opinion that, if you had the Earl of Carrick, the steward of Scotland and his brother, dot you would think your business done. On 7 July, Bruce and his friends made terms with Edward by a treaty called the Capitulation of Erdon. The Scottish lords were not to serve beyond the sea against their will and were pardoned for their recent violence in return for swearing allegiance to King Edward, the Bishop of Glasgow, James the Steward, and Sir Alexander Lindsay became sureties for Bruce until he delivered his infant daughter Marjorie as a hostage, which he never did. When King Edward returned to England after his victory at the Battle of Falkirk, the Bruce's possessions were accepted from the lordships and lands that Edward assigned to his followers. The reason for this is uncertain, though Forden records Robert fighting for Edward at Falkirk, under the command of Anthony Beck, Bishop of Durham, Annandale and Carrick. 
This participation is contested as no Bruce appears on the Falkirk role of nobles present in the English army, and two 19th century antiquarians, Alexander Morrison and George Chalmers have stated Bruce did not participate and in the following month decided to lay waste Annandale and burn Eyre Castle, to prevent it being garrisoned by the English. William Wallace resigned as Guardian of Scotland after his defeat at the Battle of Falkirk. He was succeeded by Robert Bruce and John Cummin as joint guardians, but they could not see past their personal differences. As a nephew and supporter of King John, and as someone with a serious claim to the Scottish throne, Cummin was Bruce's enemy. In 1299, William Lamberton, Bishop of St. Andrews, was appointed as a third neutral guardian to try to maintain order between Bruce and Cummin. The following year, Bruce finally resigned as Joint Guardian and was replaced by Sir Gilbert de Rumfreville, Earl of Angus. In May 1301, Umfreville, Cummin, and Lamberton also resigned as Joint Guardians and were replaced by Sir John de Solis as sole guardian. Solis was appointed largely because he was part of neither the Bruce nor the Cummin camps and was a patriot. He was an active guardian and made renewed effort to have King John return to the Scottish throne. In July 1301 King Edward I launched his sixth campaign into Scotland. Though he captured the castles of Bothwell and Turnberry, he did little to damage the Scots' fighting ability, and in January 1302 he agreed to a nine-month truce. It was around this time that Robert the Bruce submitted to Edward, along with other nobles. Even though he had been on the side of the Scots until then, there were rumours that John Balliol would return to regain the Scottish throne. Solus, who had probably been appointed by John, supported his return, as did most other nobles. But it was no more than a rumour and nothing came of it. In March 1302 Bruce sent a letter to the monks at Melrose Abbey apologising for having called tenants of the monks to service in his army when there had been no national call-up. Bruce pledged that, henceforth, he would, never again, require the monks to serve unless it was to, the common army of the whole realm, for national defence. Bruce also married his second wife that year, Elizabeth de Berg, the daughter of Richard de Berg, 2nd Earl of Ulster. By Elizabeth he had four children, David II, John, Matilda, and Margaret. In 1303, Edward invaded again, reaching Edinburgh before marching to Perth. Edward stayed in Perth until July, then proceeded via Dundee, Brecon, and Montrose to Aberdeen, where he arrived in August. From there he marched through Moray to Badenoch before retracing his path back south to Dunfermline. With the country now under submission, all the leading Scots, except for William Wallace, surrendered to Edward in February 1304. John Cummin, who was by now guardian, submitted to Edward. The laws and liberties of Scotland were to be as they had been in the days of Alexander III and any that needed alteration would be with the assent of King Edward and the advice of the Scots nobles. On the 11th of June 1304, Bruce and William Lamberton made a pact that bound them, each to the other, in friendship and alliance against all men. If one should break the secret pact, he would forfeit to the other the sum of £10,000. The pact is often interpreted as a sign of their patriotism despite both having already surrendered to the English. Homage was again obtained from the nobles and the burghs, and a parliament was held to elect those who would meet later in the year with the English parliament to establish rules for the governance of Scotland. The Earl of Richmond, Edward's nephew, was to head up the subordinate government of Scotland. While all this took place, William Wallace was finally captured near Glasgow, and he was hanged, drawn, and quartered in London on 23 August 1305. In September 1305, Edward ordered Robert Bruce to put his castle at Kildrummy, in the keeping of such a man as he himself will be willing to answer for, suggesting that King Edward suspected Robert was not entirely trustworthy, and may have been plotting behind his back. However, an identical phrase appears in an agreement between Edward and his lieutenant and lifelong friend, Aymer de Valence.
A further sign of Edward's distrust occurred on 10 October 1305, when Edward revoked his gift of Sir Gilbert de Rumfrevel's lands to Bruce that he had made only six months before. Robert Bruce as Earl of Carrick, and now 7th Lord of Annandale, held huge estates and property in Scotland and a barony and some minor properties in England, and a strong claim to the Scottish throne.